Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I'm so pleased to look out and see all of you here this afternoon for this, for this briefing, which we think is going to provide a lot of good information, good, a, a good understanding and stories for you of what is happening in states across the country, and we're going to hear uh, a sampling of, of that kind of information because it is only through understanding and knowing about the kind of investments, the kind of actions that are happening uh, uh, across our country that, that it helps us all think about the potential of what it is that we truly can all accomplish if we all work together, whether it is in our cities, whether it's in our states, whether it is here in Washington in the Congress. And energy is a critical issue for our economy, for our nation, and obviously is on the front burner for so many things that we care about and that we are also seeing discussed here in the Congress. So we are so pleased today to be uh, holding this briefing in conjunction with the Clean Energy States Alliance uh, to provide this opportunity to really talk about the kinds of innovations that are occurring uh, in states across the country and also to talk about the value, the importance of federal state partnerships. Because again, by all working together, it's really quite incredible the kinds of things that really can happen that make things better, that can create all sorts of economic development, uh, develop new technologies, and show us the way on things that we had no idea that we maybe could accomplish. So. Uh, to start off our briefing, uh, we uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Chris Murphy is no longer able to be with us today because of uh, a last minute scheduling conflict. But we are so pleased that a member of his staff, uh, Jesse Young, is able to be here and is going to uh, say a few words um, at, the, at the beginning. Jesse? Hi, folks. I'll be real quick because nobody cares what I have to say. Um, yes, we do. Yes, we do. No, no, that's a lie. Um, sorry, Chris couldn't be here. He actually just got off the um, Senate floor. He had a speech that he couldn't move on gun control, and he's probably busy um, tweeting something weird and embarrassing now. Um, but um, just want to thank you guys all for coming and just touch on a few points that I know Chris would cover were he here himself. Um, Connecticut is a small state. We are a wind-poor state. We are a solar-poor state. Our rivers have been heavily dammed. Um, we don't have much immediate, obvious potential for utility-scale renewables, yet we're doing it uh, in a lot of ways. And a lot of that work is happening at the state level, specifically around distributed generation. It's not big you know, utility-scale solar farms out in the West, but it's folks at shopping malls, at hospitals, at individual homeowners that are working with the state to get the financing they need to actually make these projects a reality. So if we can do it in a cold weather, not very sunny, not very windy state, like Connecticut that won't have access to offshore wind for at least five more years, I think anyone can do it. Connecticut in 2011 became home to the nation's first state-based clean energy finance bank. Uh, CIFIA, they were going to be here, I think they had to pull out because of a last minute um, scheduling conflict, but um, they've gone on to prove in the last two years that the private capital is out there. This is not just a question of government coming in and handing money to people. They've leveraged over $150 million in the last two years in private capital. So we know the money is there. We know with a little bit of leadership from states and from the folks up here who are doing the hard work at the state level that this can actually happen. So looking forward to the briefing. Thanks. Um, if some of you would like to come up here and sit on the dais, that is fine. You've got the handouts, hopefully, and um, so anyway, if you want chairs, please. Yeah. Any more chairs so that... I know it's not fun to have to stand for the whole thing. Okay, and we have one more over here. Okay. There's back here. Okay, there are a couple more chairs over here too, if anybody would like them. 
Do you want to hold up your hands where the chairs are so that folks can get to them easily? And then we'll... You're welcome. <laughs> Our aim is, if we can all be much more comfortable, we'll all retain a lot more of what we hear today, and that's really important. So anyway, okay, well, again, I'm so glad that everyone is here so that we can um, learn a, a lot and find out uh, about what all is happening um, uh, across the country, as I said earlier. And so the first of our speakers from us, uh, from the states um, is Sarah fisher Goad, who is the executive director of the Alaska Energy Authority. So as I said, we are literally going across the country with this. Sarah? Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about um, uh, Susitna-Watana Hydro Project. Um, and represent AEA and uh, CSIM member, um, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, you can't talk about anything in Alaska without at least setting the, setting the framework with respect to um, uh, what AEA is about and some of our, of our energy issues. Um, thanks, Warren. The Alaska Energy Authority uh, mission is to reduce the cost of energy in Alaska. We do this in a variety of ways. We um, invest in Alaska energy infrastructure, and I'll be talking about um, our latest uh, project with respect to that. Um, we are uh, working on diversifying Alaska's energy portfolio. We do have a renewable energy fund and a very active program. We have over 200 projects and over $200 million that have been in invested with state funds into that program. Uh, we are the lead agency for the state of Alaska for energy planning and policy, and we have an extensive training and technical assistance program that uh, serves a variety of communities across the, um, across the state of Alaska. So some of the Alaska's energy challenges include varied energy costs and resources by region. Uh, we have some hydro-rich areas. We have areas that are uh, uh, very diesel-dependent. Diesel we have wind that is being developed, but we do have an extreme varied energy cost um, around the state. There is declining oil production. Oil is the uh, economic uh, driver and the primary source of general fund dollars for the state of Alaska. Um, but uh, production is declining, and there is a, a pretty volatile fossil fuel cost that, um, that we also face. Um, as uh, many states, and I know as uh, federal, federal agencies understand, and federal representatives, we also face um, aging, aging facilities um, and aging energy infrastructure facilities. Um, we have several dispersed communities, and even the communities that are, are connected um, by a, a grid, it's not a, very, it's not a very strong grid, some uh, equated to somewhat of, a, of a, gravel, a gravel road as compared to a highway. Um, so um, we do are we are looking for in the state has been investing in short and long-term solutions in 2010 the state of Alaska uh, passed uh, the legislature passed a renewable energy goal a 50 percent renewable by 2025 we currently have uh, approximately um, the, the mix of 70 percent oil and gas and we have 21 percent hydro um, and a small portion of other uh, other energy uh, renewable energy, and then also coal is an, another uh, source of electricity for Alaska. Uh, right now, our renewable energy power is coming primarily from hydropower of 90 percent. All others are 10 percent, and we actually just had to update this slide. This uh, had been 97 percent hydro until we had two larger utility scale wind projects that came online. One is the Fire Island wind project of 17 megawatts and Eva Creek uh, project uh, near Healy, Alaska uh, that I believe is 24, 25, 25 megawatts. So that has uh, changed our mix. So um, although I'm going to talk about um, hydropower and the history of Susitna Watana, um, we do have a portfolio of renewable projects that we are pursuing. Um, with respect to Susitna Watana Hydro, this is not a project that's new to the state of Alaska. Um, it was originally studied in the 50s, um, mainly by the uh, federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, in the 1980s, the state was pursuing this project um, and went through uh, starting a FERC process, and I believe in the 80s had spent at least $140 million to actually pursue the project at that time. Uh, but uh, oil prices did go down, the state, state funds were, um, were reduced, 
And we also had a fairly cheap natural gas um, alternative for a lot of the, um, the energy infrastructure for the, for the state. So the project was postponed. Uh, as uh, oil prices uh, were rising in uh, 2008 and 2009, the state of Alaska and the legislature really, really started to look again at how a larger hydro project could fit into the energy mix for the state. And again, as I mentioned before, the 20, in 2010, the 50% renewable goal um, passed. Um, Alaska Energy Authority at that time was also funded to, uh, to evaluate um, and compare a couple large hydro projects. Um, and during that time, at the end of 2010, there was a preliminary decision document that uh, we called that, that was uh, passed or that we, we um, produced that explained with all the work and the detail and the information that we had in the 1980s, uh, truly the information that we had from that project um, that Susitna-Watana uh, was the project to uh, pursue. It is a bit different than what was proposed in the 80s. In the 80s, it was a three-phase, two-dam project of 1,600 megawatts, and we're looking at something significantly different now. This is a, a one-dam project um, uh, with a capacity of uh, 600 megawatts. So in 2011, we were authorized to pursue uh, this hydro pro project. Uh, the legislature did have to give us uh, authority to, um, to move forward with this. And so in 2012, we really, um, really began the studying and entered the FERC, uh, the FERC licensing process just last year. So why Susitna Watana? The state population, uh, over 80% would be served by this project. Uh, we expect during construction about 1,000 jobs um, during, during this time. Uh, hydro does provide long-term stable electric rates. We expect this project, as in many projects in the state of Alaska that have, uh, in southeast Alaska, there are, there are projects that have been in place for 100, 100 years. Um, it would provide a long-term diversification of our energy portfolio. And we aren't talking about 100% uh, hydro or all just one energy source. We truly do believe that the diver diversification of our resources is very, very important. Um, it is a clean, reliable energy source, and it does promote integration of variable power sources. So we think uh, with our existing hydro resources, with this project, and with the wind projects in the rail belt area, that we'll have a very, very good way to integrate and to have some hydro-to-hydro -hydro coordination of of the projects um, and um, also with the, with the uh, uh, gas turbines that also serve the rail belt area that there is a very good integration process. So specific in project highlights um, for the Susitna Watana, it's at river mile 184, it's um, 87 miles um, uh, upriver from Talkeetna and it is um, upstream from Devil's Canyon which actually acts as a very natural um, impediment um, to uh, fish passage, um, and it would again provide 50% of the rail belt's energy demand. Um, the annual energy for the project is uh, is estimated to be 2,800 uh, gigawatt hours. So where we're at right now, we are in the in the FERC uh, licensing process. We've done our preliminary planning in uh, in 2011. Um, we have implemented some preliminary field studies and we we have been working on doing a lot of public outreach um, we have uh, applied for our permits and we are starting our formal formal field season this year so in 2012 to really get us uh, ready to, uh, to propose a study plan we did a significant amount of field work last year which really helped uh, synthesize the information that was provided in um, the 80s uh, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, coordination with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. We're also working on engineering of the project and we have also completed an independent cost estimate. So the accomplishments is FERC has approved our uh, study plan. It's 58 studies. Um, there is a significant amount of work in the field going on right now on logistics um, and health, safety and environment planning. We're also um, getting ready to finalize a contract for a financial advising firm. We're working with utility coordination and, of course, extensive stakeholder outreach. So hopefully this, this is my one slide. I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, there it is. Um, the 58 studies actually are scrolling on this, on this screen. There's 186,000 acres that are part of the study plan. So 
um, this is just to, to, to show that we, you know, we are serious about, about doing this. We want to do this project right. Um, we are looking at a very extensive uh, study plan. Um, the studies uh, are, we, we've tried to just at least simplify a Gantt chart to show uh, 11 areas of study. The 58 studies are really divided into these 11 areas, and this gives you an idea of where, where we will be or why we will be in the field for the next couple of years. Um, and just in conclusion, I just wanted to show a little bit of uh, Alaska's energy costs. Um, you can see there's a wide variety, variety of energy for electrical costs. Um, in the lower level, you have Juneau, Anchorage, and Fairbanks um, are really some of the lowest electricity costs. We do have communities that pay almost a dollar a kilowatt hour for electricity. And some of the costs that are, that are lower than, than Juneau's costs are actually hydro communities. Those are Ketchikan, Wrangell, and Petersburg. Um, so the, the other slide is also just to kind of show a, a, a distinction, too, with respect to um, heating, costs, heating costs where Anchorage is a natural gas uh, heated community in Nome uses and relies upon diesel fuel for heat. And I just wanted to show too our 50-year uh, average rate, um, it is adjusted for inflation, is uh, looking at about six cents per kilowatt hour. These are very rough estimates. This project is estimated to cost 5.2 billion dollars, um, but this is something that um, you know we've we've taken a very conservative approach to. Um, to look at these look at these numbers and project the estimated cost um, for the project. So, and normally I give this presentation for like about an hour, an hour and a half. So, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And I must say, in terms of thinking about those 58 studies and going through, reading all of those, looking at how they should all be put together to make sure the project is done right, my hat's off to you. That's pretty impressive. Um, and, and I think everybody was going, a dollar a kilowatt hour, oh my god, right? Or that should have been your feeling. Um, and so anyway, we are now going to take a stroll down the coast to California. Uh, we're going to hear from um, the California Energy Commission from Commissioner Andrew McAllister. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, bring greetings on behalf of uh, Governor Jerry Brown. Um, he would love to be here, I'm sure. But uh, I'm really happy to be here myself. Um, I'm actually, that was a great presentation. I'm reminded of some of the work we do in California with the federal government and really the partnership that has to be there uh, on the desert renewables. So if you look at all those studies and you sort of translate it to the desert, we have similar kinds of issues going on and many, many gigawatt hours of potential projects down there in the desert. Um, and, and the federal partnership is very essential there. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm going to talk about California's customer side solar programs. And it's really one example of uh, well-designed programs that take the market into account and, and can evolve with the way the market develops and achieve success and really true scale. I mean, the scale is pretty mind-boggling and it's showing no signs of abating. Um, so I do have a number of slides which I'm going to run through quickly, but basically the overall message uh, that I want to deliver is that we're scaling up solar on both new and existing buildings uh, in California tremendously. Uh, these are not your father's or your grandfather's uh, programs. Uh, Public-private partnerships are here, and they are a great thing. And uh, the marketplace and the state in California are really doing handshakes that have a big, big impact, and, and one benefits from the other. There's a lot of leverage going on there. So uh, these programs both support and respond to market developments. Uh, California, as many of you know or assume, uh, I think has a very deep commitment and lots of skin in this game. We have huge goals for both energy efficiency and renewable energy at all scales. Uh, the governor has a goal to implement 12,000 megawatts of localized renewable supply uh, by 2020. We have similarly ambitious, uh, if not more so, goals for energy efficiency. That's reducing the need. Uh, so really all this is to make our energy system more robust, uh, respond to climate change, improve comfort, economic well-being, create jobs, all those wonderful things that happen when uh, consistent long-term commitment to clean energy is the, is the fact, is the lay of the land. Uh, and finally, um, 
the message is that the federal government is a really key partner in all this and, and helping it happen. Uh, we have a large economy. We have got 35 plus million people now. So uh, we do a lot of things on our own, but we really rely on DOE and we want to contribute to DOE's efforts uh, and the other agencies in, in, in the federal realm. And uh, I think having communicating that directly is really important. So that's just, uh, this, is, this is San Diego, uh, Google Maps of San Diego. Each one of those little dots is a small scale rooftop solar system. There's a bunch of residential, there's some commercial, there's some thermal. Uh, hot water heating, um, but there are about 150,000 of those systems around the state at this point. That's just San Diego's county, really. Um, and there's more dots appearing. It's not real time, but uh, if it were, you'd see some dots appearing as, uh, right in front of us. Um, so I'm going to talk about two programs. One is the, their overall uh, moniker is the California Solar Initiative. Uh, one of them is for existing buildings. The other is called the New Solar Homes Partnership, and that's for uh, new construction. Uh, they're both uh, important parts of the overall small-scale customer-side solar programs in the state. So it's a very large uh, investment. It's uh, more than well over halfway through. Uh, it's a 10-year program that is scheduled to sunset in 2016. But uh, as far as the goals, we're meeting them. Looks like uh, well ahead of time. It's a three point three and a half roughly billion dollar effort um, funded by ratepayers and some a couple of other smaller funding sources. This is about net metered installation, so it's behind the meter uh, in both residential and non-residential realms. So the, the overall goals are to get 3,000 megawatts in small-scale customer side uh, solar electric systems installed. And really the even more important goal is to have a, a self-sustaining solar industry in California moving forward. So wean, and you'll see how this is built into the program, wean the industry from subsidies, ratepayer subsidies and others um, over time and do that in a way that, that is seamless and it doesn't create any trauma over time. And then on the new home front, we also have very aggressive goals there as well. So there are three. I'm going to talk about the left two of these, the CPUC's program, which is the Mainstream California Solar Initiative, and the, the Energy Commission runs the New Solar Home Partnerships Partnership for new construction. So all those goals add up to 3,000 megawatts. Um, we are well on our way there. We're getting close to two gigawatts um, of rooftop solar. At the end of last year, it was about one and a half, um, and about almost half of that was in uh, 2012. So things are really scaling up quickly. Uh, the residential, in particular, is really going crazy. Uh, over 150,000 systems. Um, it's quite uh, lots of jobs being created. Lots of solar and a lot of, of innovative business models that sale have in, have sort of unique sales cycles. Uh, lots of interaction, different kinds of interaction, different different kinds of pathways to get to the customer, um, including well, some interesting financing initiatives. Lots of third-party ownership. Lots of innovative. Uh, lots of innovation in that realm. Uh, and not not the least of the drivers is the price declines that we're seeing in the solar market. Uh, actually, I will point out the California Solar Statistics is a really interesting website. If you go there, you can slice and dice the actual data um, any way you want. So if you're, if you're a market participant and you're thinking of making an investment in solar or you're wanting to see what's happening in your community, you can go download an Excel spreadsheet that has every single one of those 151,000 systems with equipment, installed cost, incentive amount, and, you know, long list of, of data about each of those systems, and you can use it for yourself. That, I think, is a, a lesson in and of itself that transparency helps the marketplace. Without that data being available, um, the due diligence for innovation um, and investment would not have been possible. So the state sponsored that, and the market responded. And I think it's a really uh, uh, very clear that that happened. Anybody in California who's involved in this marketplace will tell you that. And so I think that's been a really great... Um, part of this partnership with the private sector. Um, so we think about 25,000 California jobs, uh, those are direct jobs, um, have been created uh, through the last few years. This program started in 2007. And as I said, leasing and power purchase models have really increased access. So initially it probably was more relatively well-off people on the coast, but now it's really moved inland, it's moved um, down market, it's moved really solidly to the middle class. And so I think uh, access to solar is really opening up quite a bit. Uh, so our goals for existing buildings, um, let's see, I'll, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just highlight the big, the big picture here. Um, 
there's an emphasis in the program on system performance. So the incentives that the program has paid decline over time, and they are they respond to um, to performance. So most of the incentives actually at this point are only paid with actual performance, measured performance, measured kilowatt hour production, and so that's a way for accountability to really be built into the program. Uh, there's also a relatively small part of the program, which is solar water heating, which in uh, today's natural gas prices aren't, isn't really helping quite a bit. But, uh, uh, but I think there's a, you know, we live in California. We have natural gas water heat that produces carbon dioxide, and we really want to figure out ways long term to avoid those emissions and, and get solar thermal on every house. Um, the design, as I pointed out, those declining lines are the incentives over, over time, and there are no dates at the bottom. There's no date certain there. It's all about volume. So the more volume we have, the, the more um, the incentives decline, and we're getting towards the tail end of that. And you'll see the actual accomplishments uh, probably are more accelerated even than the, uh, than the program design. So we're really we're, we're going, going well. So new homes... Um, the New Solar Homes Partnership um, is a really critical part of the puzzle, and it's uh, lagging, I would say, strictly because, well, mostly because the housing market busted, as you all know, and it's now clawing its way back. And so now that we have a housing market in California, we have a lot of opportunity to get solar built into those, new, uh, those new con newly constructed buildings. And it's a different marketplace, obviously, than the existing building stock. So we're linking it explicitly to energy efficiency. So in order to sort of participate in the solar program, you really have to build definitely to code and somewhat beyond code. California has very, um, uh, say, progressive, uh, uh, relatively strict uh, new construction building codes through our Title 24. And so we're really trying to move over time towards a zero net energy. We actually have a policy goal in the state to get every newly constructed residence uh, by 2020 to be zero net energy. And so the new solar homes partnership and the building standards are really part and parcel of, of how we're going to achieve that goal. So energy efficiency and solar have to work together. Uh, I'm going to blast through a couple of slides here. We have, uh, uh, like I said, we have 58 megawatts instead of a gigawatt on the new solar homes, but as new construction picks up. We're definitely, we have a big pipeline full of applications, so we're expecting that to scale quite a bit. Um, but you know, our peak demand in the state is about 60,000 gigawatts, and so this is an appreciable percentage of that now as far as the installed capacity of solar, and we need to get to, across all renewables, we need to get to 33 percent RPS. Very likely that that's going to go up. Uh, the renewables portfolio standard is currently at 33 percent. I'd say it's very likely to go up in the, in the next few years at least once. Um, so, again, we're seeing the NSHP is driving a shift to solar. Home builders now are using it as a differentiator f to get quicker and better sales. Um, people want it in California, and builders want to offer it. A couple of our leading builders have actually decided that 100% of their newly constructed buildings are going to be solar. They're going to have solar on them. So that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with this program. Um, and then finally... I wanted to just um, highlight the ways that the federal government ha uh, participates in this. Obviously, the federal ITC is huge, 30% ITC, and in the commercial realm, the accelerated depreciation. Both of those are, are extremely valuable to companies that are building businesses in this space. And so you know, any discontinuity in that uh, certainly can decline over time. I think that's a good strategy. But discontinuities are generally a bad thing for markets. Uh, and so uh, would like to see um, that happen over time, obviously. Um, and it complements the state policies that we have, such as net energy metering um, and the solar incentives and feed-in tariffs that are coming up. Um, across, uh, across the U.S., but certainly in California as well. Um, Department of Energy really helps for facilitate some of the cross-cutting issues, like access to data, permitting support, um, facilitating cross-governmental uh, discussions across states and across uh, local jurisdictions. It's been extremely helpful, and I think uh, the Solar America Cities that I was involved in in a previous life and uh, also the Sunshot Initiative have both been really examples of how DOE has done a lot with not that many resources and would definitely, I think, like to see that continue. And then Zero Net Energy that I mentioned is a really uh, ripe area for innovation. Uh, it doesn't have to cost that much more to build a building, and right now, you know, it, it tends to cost a little bit more because it's kind of custom. We need to build that into the fabric of the building industry such that we really bring everybody up to understand the, the best practices and make that happen more seamlessly. Um, so uh, 
I, I, I think that summarizes really what I wanted to say. I think uh, the states, a lot of the states you'll hear from today have really interesting things going on. And uh, it does get pulled together. The, the federal government can provide a lot of resource or a lot of uh, sort of capital and different kinds of capital to pull it together and help us all do better. Um, and, and, and we, um, they. So I think it's a, quite a valuable forum here today and, and, and beyond and very much looking forward to continuing this discussion. So thank you all for coming. I'm very, very happy to have had the chance to be here. Thanks very much, Andrew. I think it, that it's really exciting to sort of see that some of the different approaches that are being taken. And I'll tell you, each one of these folks, as well as when you think when you talk to folks from some of the other states that are part of CISA, they could all talk about a lot of other projects and policies that are underway in their states and are just highlighting some examples of that for you today. So hopefully this will just whet your appetite to ask a lot more questions um, because I think you should be really impressed by so many things that are going on and what this whole state-federal partnership really represents. So we're not going to swing back to the East Coast and we will hear from Andy Bridges who is the Senior Director for Renewable Energy Generation for the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Andy is going to be covering Massachusetts as well as Connecticut today and so he's truly living up to his name of Bridges. Got it? <laughs> and Well, thank you, and there, there's good reason why I'm covering both, and I'll cover that in a second. But let's start with Massachusetts. Um, Mass Clean Energy Center is funded by a system benefits charge, small charge on electric bills that applies to both residential and, and commercial customers. Uh, and they turn that money around about $25 million a year to support renewable energy in a variety of ways. They uh, make investments in up-and-coming companies trying to capture some of the intellectual property coming out of our great research universities. we working on developing a trained re uh, workforce to work in energy efficiency and renewable energy in the state. Uh, we make investments in infrastructure projects. We have the world's largest indoor blade, wind blade testing center, structural testing center, which was partially funded by ARA. Uh, and we're building out the port of New Bedford uh, to the tune of $100 million to support the offshore wind industry. Uh, and then the group I manage uh, is focused on deploying commercially available renewable energy generation like solar and wind and thermal technologies. So, on top of the federal tax credits that are available for PV, 30% tax credit, uh, Massachusetts has providing, been providing subsidies since 2002 uh, for solar projects. Uh, however, it wasn't until Governor Patrick came to office in 2007 that we really made a long-term and significant uh, uh, financial investment in growing that industry uh, and have since grown it from about three megawatts of solar power to, to over 250 uh, with a new goal of 1.6 gigawatts uh, in the state. Uh, but the fact is between I, I know feed-in tariffs are a swear word in many parts of the country, but between federal tax credits, state tax credits, incentives from agencies like ours, uh, selling of renewable energy certificates, property tax exemptions, whatever the incentives are, it's a very complex network, and particularly at the residential scale, very hard for residential customers who may have a passing interest, uh, you know, don't want to dive in and make this their life's work uh, to put solar on their house uh, to figure out how to do it. So enter Solarize Mass. This, um, uh, full disclosure, was stolen from the state of uh, Oregon, where it was started in Portland uh, with great success. But uh, we, we took it and we've made some modifications to it and we've had tremendous success. The goal is to simplify the process for residential customers, uh, small-scale customers. It's actually open to commercial and nonprofits as well, but uh, up to 15 kilowatts, which is you know, typically residential size to simplify the process for them to go solar. So we're trying to increase the competition uh, among installers for the business to drive prices down. We are doing aggressive outreach and education and reducing the marketing and acquisition cost. And we think that's primarily the cost we're driving out of the process. Uh, and just offering a simplified process so a residential customer can come. They know that someone has vetted the installer. They know it's a good deal related to the equipment that they're providing. Uh, and they feel more confident moving ahead. All that leads to lower prices and increased adoption. 
major players. Uh, we've partnered with our Department of Energy Resources to run this program. Uh, we take the responsibility for choosing the towns through a competitive process to running the uh, RFP that chooses the installer to serve that town during the course of the Solarize uh, uh, campaign, which lasts about four to five months. We partner, uh, uh, we engage technical consultants as needed. Um, we resolve conflicts where they come up. Uh, and in the end, I think the state has played a very important role uh, at a distance uh, from helping to run the program. But we rely heavily on the community uh, in terms of their volunteer networks and their local networks to get the word out. So uh, the community ultimately makes the selection of the installer. They provide a solar coach who answers 90% of the questions that come up during the campaign, uh, volunteers and outreach. And then uh, the installer plays obviously the biggest role. They do a free site assessment. If you're at all interested, they'll come out and look at your house and find out if it's the right technology for you. They offer the pricing, they do the installation, the permitting, all that stuff. All the homeowner really has to do is sign up for a free site assessment and talk to their neighbors because their incentives, the more people participate, the lower the price goes for everybody. And that creates an incentive for neighbors to talk to neighbors and greatly expands the amount of outreach uh, that happens during the course of the campaign. So we've run this, uh, started in 2011 in four communities, and then in 2012 we did it in 17 communities. This year we're going to do two tranches of 10 communities each. Uh, uh, but 31 communities uh, to date have been selected. We've had the participation of both small local installers and some of the large, uh, more nationally based installers. Uh, the local presence is very important to many of the towns that, that uh, you know, want to provide that uh, economic benefit uh, to, to the local companies. And the way it works is the installer offers tiered pricing. So if only one person participates, uh, you get a price that's very competitive and below market, but uh, you know, doesn't represent a dramatic savings. But as those systems grow, and by the time you get to tier five, we're talking about 50 average size residential systems. As you get to tier five, more and more costs have come down. Uh, and the goal is to see how low we can get the cost to go. And the installer benefits, obviously, by the economies of scale for multiple installations, having a big uh, book of business locked up in one community to reduce their costs uh, and so forth. And the installers do offer two types of ownership models. There's always the you can just buy it model uh, and or use a home equity loan, whatever it might be, to finance the purchase. Or they offer the third party model, which Andrew referred to, which is also growing in Massachusetts. Not quite as much as in Connecticut, but we're sort of cranky uh, New Englanders. Uh, and it's important that it's a limited time offer, as with anything uh, where you're asking uh, installers to commit to pricing. It needs to be a limited time. And having a deadline drives, drives action, too. So how's it worked? <laughs> this is uh, the results from last summer's program. Uh, we talked to 5,400 people in the 17 communities we did. And that is really uh, a tremendous accomplishment in and of itself. We've held community meetings like this one, overflow capacity, lots of excitement, lots of awareness, and people trying to learn more about how this works. Uh, so we've had great participation. Ultimately, 800 people moved forward uh, with projects representing about five megawatts of capacity. Now we hear from commercial installers, you did five megawatts of capacity in four months. It takes us a year to set up a one megawatt uh, you know, commercial scale project. Uh, yeah, we did it, and we did it in 800 different locations. Uh, so you know, we think it is having a dramatic uh, impact. You can see how the adoption uh, uh, occurred, and, and various events, you know, it gradually accelerated as we went, including the last week we signed up over a megawatt when people got scared that they were going to lose out on a good deal which is exactly what we wanted them to be scared of. <laughs> so uh, here's how it looked. The green bars that you see on the screen represent the difference between the tier one introductory price and the tier five lowest price. And the blue dots on those bars show the tier that each community got to. So in last year, uh, 10 communities um, uh, overall, some were partnered uh, together there, like Wayland, Lincoln, Sudbury on the right, and Pittsfield, Lenox. Uh, 10 communities got to that lowest tier. 
the red line at the top, the red dotted line, is the average cost of uh, PV in Massachusetts when we started the program, 523 per watt. And the purple line, sort of in the middle bottom, is the cost, the average cost realized during the Solarize program. It's about a 20, 21% uh, reduction. Now, that's the base cost. Each individual house may have a few things that they opt for, uh, like uh, premium panels, American-made panels, or uh, monitoring, automatic monitoring and reporting that might drive up that cost. And when we add in those adders, that purple line moves up a little bit, just north of $4 uh, watt, but still represented. Uh, between a 15 and 20 percent savings off the average cost uh, in Massachusetts, which, which we think is, is really dramatic uh, savings. And in terms of adoption, those kind of savings, you know, result. So the blue bars you see at the bottom of these columns are all the solar projects that these towns did in the 10 years leading up to Solarize last summer. And the green bars uh, are how many projects they did during Solarize last summer. So in all but uh, Boston, frankly, every community more than doubled the number of projects they'd ever done before uh, in a four or five month period, which is tremendous um, uh, result. The red dots you see scattered there are what we call our adoption rate multiplier. And when you compare the adoption in the five months last year to the five months in 2011, the average community raised their adoption rate by 20 20x, not 20%, 20x, uh, which is really dramatic growth, obviously. The industry as a whole in Massachusetts goes up about 1.5x uh, during that same time period. So this is what we uh, see as, as the benefit. We think uh, uh, the challenges are scaling this uh, to, uh, to serve a greater number of communities. We frankly thought that the uh, model would be taken and uh, just rolled out by other installers who would approach communities and say, here, all right, great, let's do it and offer you that deal. It turns out that many communities you know, do value the role of the state or a nonprofit entity in running that and having no vested interest. Uh, so we're struggling with how to scale it uh, without uh, you know, the staff to just infinitely scale scale it, um, uh, and that'll be the next challenge. But we are also you know, focused on how this model might now be uh, rolled out for other technologies and other initiatives that we have. So I will say thank you. I'm putting up Elizabeth Kennedy's contact information, not because I don't want to answer questions about it. I'm more than happy to, but because I... Uh, last Friday was my last day at Mass Clean Energy Center, and I have accepted a job at the Connecticut Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority, which starts on Monday. So uh, that, uh, I'm actually a resident of Connecticut, so it's greatly shortening my commute, uh, among other things, but I'm very excited to join Brian Garcia and his team at Cephia uh, and, and join that. And I don't know if these two are tied together. They aren't. Can we put up the Connecticut slides? It's coming up. Okay. <laughs> so, with the disclaimer that I don't, I'm not yet being paid by Cephia and probably don't understand my job uh, as, well as, as well as they hope, uh, I, I will cover uh, Brian Garcia, who is the president and CEO of Cephia, wanted to be here uh, and was called back to, to uh, deal with some issues in, in Connecticut. Uh, but uh, I'm pleased to you know, kind of run through his slides. Connecticut was a state that stepped up and said, hey, Massachusetts, those sound like really interesting results. We'd like to do it. We have no pride of ownership. We, we shouldn't. We stole it from Oregon. And we shipped them the documents in word form, and they changed Connecticut to Mass or Massachusetts to Connecticut, and uh, we're pretty much ready to go. And they have been running SolarEyes as well. Now, Connecticut's a little bit different. Cephia is a little bit different than Mass Clean Energy Center in that, as Jesse alluded to, they are um, uh, func functioning as a green bank. And the mission of Cephia is to transition programs away from direct government subsidies to ways to leverage private capital. And so they are implementing a broad set of financing uh, tools uh, that will do just that. And, and as you said, they've leveraged you know, over $150 million so far, and they're building out all of their programs to take advantage of that. As they go through that process, they are still uh, providing some rebates and implementing programs uh, like Solarize. And Brian wanted to make sure that we acknowledged uh, some of the great partnerships we have, the federal agencies, EPA and DOE. Uh, the uh, C Action Network is the state level energy efficiency action network, uh, which has been very active. Connecticut's partnered with the Better, Better Buildings program, uh, and as well as Massachusetts.
Massachusetts uh, been a beneficiary of the Sunshot Initiative uh, funding, which is also helping to drive out some of those soft costs related to building solar uh, uh, that uh, beyond the simple equipment costs account for the differences we see in the United States versus countries like Germany, uh, which are installing solar at about half the price. So Connecticut's been very active pursuing that fund and, and very thankful to partner with DOE on those programs. Connecticut solarized program they have done in four communities uh, in the first year, and it really had similar results. The percentages you see in bold font down there are, is the growth in the number of installations in that community, uh, which is tremendous, all over well over 100 uh, percent. And the impact on pricing was also similar. The purple line in the middle was their current average installed cost of about five dollars per watt, not dissimilar from where we are in Massachusetts. Uh, the jagged blue line at the is what each individual installer in those four towns, uh, what their average cost was in the state. And again, the green bars represent the difference between that initial tier price and the bottom tier price uh, where they got to. So uh, Durham got to $3.60 from, uh, from $5.43 uh, for that installer. Uh, Fairfield got to three fifty-five. dollars And then again, when you take into account those adders that may apply in our old New England homes and, and just uh, uh, options that each homeowner adds, uh, that comes up a little bit to that red bar, takes away a little of those savings, but still represents a dramatic discount off the uh, uh, off the original price. Did I go past one here? Sorry, there's a missing slide, uh, which I'll just summarize for you. One, another way Connecticut looks at it is how it's changed, how the impact of Solarize has changed the payback for solar. So solar PV, uh, without any subsidy in Connecticut, without any uh, anything except the federal uh, subsidy, uh, is about a 12.7 year payback on average. If you take into account the current ratepayer subsidies in Connecticut, um, we're down to about nine year payback. And the Solarize program, by driving out additional costs related to customer acquisition and, and scaling, uh, drove the payback down to 6.3 years. So uh, you're talking about you know, driving a good three years off the payback that the rest of the state is, is realizing. And this is one reason why it's so uh, I impressive. And, and, and in Connecticut, they measured that it drove costs about $7,700 out of the cost of each individual installation. That represents you know, real savings to customers who are A, paying the surcharge, B, paying the fifth or sixth highest electricity rates in the country and, and uh, you know, suffering under those costs. So the next thing Connecticut wants to figure out, uh, and I think similar to Massachusetts, is how do we roll this out uh, for other populations? Does it wor is it going to work in distressed municipalities? Uh, how can we make solar more accessible uh, and more affordable to lower income customers? What happens when you add the concept of the Green Bank to it? And Connecticut has its own solar lease program uh, and loan products where they can drive out some of the costs of financing uh, and you know, further reduce the cost. Can that ex even further accelerate the model? And then you know, can it be supported or adapted to support the ramp up of other technologies like fuel conversions from 90% uh, of the fuel oil in the United States that's burned for heat is burned in New England. So there's a big focus on converting those that convert can convert from fuel oil to natural gas, which is so much more cost effective at this point for heating. Uh, so Cephi will be focused on uh, funding those fuel conversions where it makes sense. Obviously, we're all focused on supporting energy efficiency. Is this a model that could be rolled out to promote energy efficiency as well as renewable energy? And other renewable energy systems like solar hot water or geothermal heat pumps, you know, have how would it be applicable? And I think that just the general concepts of raising awareness, simplifying the process, of course, have a lot of promise to do that in all those technologies. That's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Pretty impressive. Two hats there. And, and I must say, um, I bet Senator Wyden would be really happy to know that um, Oregon is being emulated in a number of other states on the other, other side of the country. Um, we are now going to turn to Ann Isel, who is the Chief of Staff in the Maryland Energy Administration. Ann? Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a mission for all of you. 
I'm familiar with Ocean City, Maryland. I want you, while I'm talking, just to visualize a day like today. You're on the boardwalk. You're looking out over the horizon. You're enjoying the cool breeze of the ocean. And if you squint, you could probably, we hope to see, by 2018, the size of my thumb, offshore wind turbines. So with that, let me get started. And uh, let me figure this out. Um, I wanted to start by, um, really, it takes leadership, direction, and support. And that's truly what we have um, in our Governor O'Malley. Um, up there uh, is uh, three of his 15 strategic goals um, of energy and climate. And to put this in perspective, one of the 15 goals is to end childhood hunger in Maryland. So you can see how important energy is to the governor, which makes my job a lot easier, um, but it also makes it a lot tougher in time. So. Um, with that, the three goals, I'm sorry, the three goals are the empower goal of saving 15% by 2015 in energy goal, both demand and energy, um, also a greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas goal, and then the one I'm talking about today is our RPS goal of 20% by 2022. Um, with that, what we did was we started with, okay, we, we have a 20% goal by 2020. How are we going to get there? And actually doing the wedge chart that you see up there, taking a look at the hydro, the solar. So if you look at the chart, you notice that we're slightly missing that goal. So how are we going to fill that gap? And that's where we really started focusing on offshore wind. And you can see the, the gap is filled. The first part of this chart is showing actually what's happening in the state of Maryland. And then the kind of the shaded area that's a little hard to see with the brightness of the room is where we need to go by 2022 as we build up the different renewables. And you can see the bottom one, the red, is the hydro. And the difference um, that you see with the rainfall is what makes the difference in the hydro chart. And then the proud day, um, just last April, we signed into law uh, the offshore wind bill, uh, um, April 9th, 2013, to create um, 200 megawatts by 2018. So how do we get there? And this is just a list that we've started to put together, trying to build the timeline. Um, and it's really what we've been doing is creating a project, not just the policy. Um, working with the different state agencies and the federal um, agencies to have turbine spinning. Um, so. The offshore wind bill, the financing or the funding support, but the offshore wind bill requires the state utilities to enter into a power purchase agreement. The bill creates offshore wind renewable credits or OREX. Um, these OREX are geared to provide the developer a guaranteed revenue for 20 years. So the OREX are at about $190 per megawatt for a wind farm of approximately 200 megawatts. Um, with the impact, capping the impact to residential customers in Maryland to $1.50 per household and then a 1.5% uh, annual bill for the non-residential. And this model is just showing how the OREX uh, work. So the next stage is really looking at the developers. Um, step one, the developers will determine the total revenue needed for ensuring financing. Um, step two gets into the developers will sell the elemented bundled energy. And then step three is the uh, PSC, um, Public Service Commission will calculate how much the net cost will be in the Maryland Public Service Commission. Um, the Offshore Wind Development Fund was uh, started in a settlement of the merger between Exelon Corporation and the Constellation Energy Group. Um, Exelon made available $30 million for advancements of offshore wind um, off the coast of Maryland. And this is really to provide some stability information to the developers, um, reduce some of their financial risk uh, through um, geophysical mapping surveys, kind of adding that next level to the ocean floor, getting real data, um, going out there, taking a look at it, testing the wind. So trying to make their financing a little bit more easier when they get into the bidding part of this. 
The other area we really started looking at and developing the offshore wind was the port development. You know, how are you going to get the wind turbines off that coast of Ocean City, Maryland that you're now all sitting there looking at? So what we did was we, we worked very closely, we've been working very closely with the Maryland Port Authority and the Maryland Energy Administration, our, my, our administration, to take a proactive approach at exploring ways in the future um, offshore wind industry could benefit from this. So the Port Authority and MEA um, met with the European port operators to gain firsthand insight to some of the practices. Um, some of the innovative things that we're really looking at, and this is what this slide is trying to show, is the lo um, logistical solutions for the offshore wind. Uh, one possible solution currently being explored include barging of the offshore wind turbines and blades from the Port of Baltimore to a rendezvous point um, with insulation jack-up vessels um, in southern part of Maryland waters in the Chesapeake. Um, this approach would save the jack-up vessels um, additional 170 miles up to the port and back um, travel for each trip they needed. So this, is, this isn't any scale or any site location, but it's just kind of showing, trying to you know, look at things innovatively and how can you move these large turbines off the coast of Maryland. Uh, one of the steps um, in looking at this is uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulation Enforcements. Uh, when we first started three years ago, they were BOMER. Um, they've now, since uh, 2011, it's now BOM. They've, they've lost the RE part of this. But we've been engaged with the federal agencies, local state agencies, of really exploring and looking at the leasing of this. Um, upon request, we had our first meeting April 14, 2010. So three years ago, we've been working with BOMA um, on the offshore lease, looking at the proposed sales notice. Um, so that's our next critical step as we're waiting for this proposed sales notice. Uh, there's been delays on the uh, along the way, but now it's to the point where you know it's all merging together. We just passed our offshore wind bill. We need to be working with the PSC, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, the way the process worked is the task force accepted MEA's uh, recommendations and identified the preliminary area, which you see up here, um, and eight developers expressed interest. From that, with the input from the working groups, that site was reduced to what you see up on the screen to make allowances for the shipping and other concerns that were in the ocean area. So it brought that area down into two areas, A and B. Um, so the theme that we've been hearing throughout the day is really, you know, how critical the federal government is with this partnership. So let me briefly just go through three points up here. Um, as I've mentioned before, one of the critical um, points is, and you can see it highlighted um, in the kind of the orangish color, is BOEM's, you know, involvement. And this is the proposed sales um, and leasing. Um, you can also see in the blue, um, Maryland's a PSC and some of the things, and there, we're now into a dual path that we need information uh, for our developers to know to be able to bid on these sites. So that's um, kind of the critical point that's coming on here. Um, the sales notice um, is first extended, and then they have 60 days to make their comments um, period, which developed. And then from there, they go into an after-proposal sales notice from the interiors, and then, then the final notice. So you, there's these timelines that are all set up. So while this is going on, at the same time, the Maryland Public Service Commission will begin developing regulations to process, evaluate, review, and approve the offshore wind projects. Um, the regulation period will require the commissioner to work hard to establish this regulatory process. Um, as it is new for somewhat at BOEM, it's also very new for Maryland and the PSC to develop what these regulations are going to look for, look like. Um, and then this is just highlighting the steps that um, need necessary for BOEM. But we still need to get to the first step of the, you know, the issue, the proposed sales notice. So that's really our first ask is, you know, getting that released. The next one is um, really looking at uh, what Senator Carper is doing as far as um, extending the ITC. 
um, the ITC for projects that commence construction before January 1st of 2014. Um, but as you can tell from the timeline I laid out, offshore wind won't be available and ready at that point. So what the bill is trying to extend for offshore wind in the third bullet there is um, to credit the first 3,000 megawatts of offshore wind facilities in place into service instead of like the stop and go type of thing, but have a consistency in funding and stream. And really the last ask is just, uh, you know, assistance, you know, with grants um, to support the offshore wind, some of the surveys that are going on. Um, also, you know, looking at assistance with the requiring of strengthening the ports. Um, and then the third one is really looking at some of the existing funding streams like Tiger and looking at right now Tiger doesn't apply to offshore wind. It's not multi-states. So maybe taking some of the funding like Tiger and being able to adapt it to the offshore wind projects. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. I think probably a lot of us have seen a number of articles around, you know, with regard to um, action by the legislature on the offshore wind uh, uh, legislation, which has been going on for the past several years. And there's been a lot of talk with regard to both the, the, the rest of the East Coast and the West Coast. And so it's interesting to get brought up to date in terms of what's, what's happening on that whole front. To round out uh, talking about um, states, the innovation, uh, the fact that there are 19 states and the District of Columbia that have public benefit funds and how these are really have been used by um, states, by these entities to invest to bring down the costs of renewable power generation to really look at how it's complementary to efficiency investments in these different states as well. Um, we are now going to hear from Lou Milford who is the founder of the Clean Energy States Alliance, bringing this together. And Lou is also the president of the Clean Energy Group. Lou? Hi, thanks a lot. You can take your glasses off. I have no slides. So uh, <laughs> you actually have to listen to, a, to rather than reading. Uh, I, I just want to start out with this to, to um, sort of tell two quick stories. Uh, there were two news articles last week that I think kind of tell a tale uh, about the state of uh, clean energy around the rest of the United States. One um, is that a, a conservative group whose name will, will go un, unmentioned um, uh, was reported to have sort of failed spectacularly at um, reversing um, any, any of the uh, state renewable portfolio laws around the country. That, that happened last week. There's a story about that. At the same time, another conservative group, whose name I will mention, Chamber of Commerce, actually they're a local, um, uh, they have a local center within the Chamber of Commerce, uh, issued a report that probably could have been written by NRDC, name your environmental group, uh, that basically said that the clean energy economy uh, is really going like gangbusters and that the local chambers of commerce are in the middle of it. Um, and that clean energy is really a key part of local economic development around the country. Um, so either, you know, one group is really smart, and maybe one group's just sort of a smart aleck. Maybe, perhaps, I don't, I don't know which. Um, sorry about that. I just couldn't, couldn't help. But what, what's really going on here? Um, I think what's really going on is that there's sort of this fundamental transformation that's happened outside of Washington. Um, and the transformation is that um, a kind of a fad has turned into an economic development play, state by state by, t by state. Um, I mean, what you're, what you're seeing up here from, you know, California, uh, Alaska, uh, Maryland, the, you know, 20-some odd states that, uh, as, uh, as Andrew said, put, put skin in the game, are putting their own dollars uh, on the table. And in many cases, <clears throat> hundreds of millions, close to a billion dollars a year in state investment <clears throat> in these technologies, everything from solar to wind, biomass, you name it. Um, and they're not doing it anymore only um, because they think that it's a, uh, a strong environmental play. They're doing it for those reasons, of course. Um, but the rationale has shifted. It's expanded. It's much more diverse. And largely the rationale in many states is because um, there are businesses there now. Um, there are real jobs. Um, and one of the reasons for the failures 
to reverse what's in place now is that after 15 or 20 years, there are significant industries that have been created that depend for their future um, on the continuation of a clean energy economy. Um, and that, if you look to the early 90s and you look to today, that's a fundamental transformation in the politics, um, kind of the economic basis, the energy economics, and it's just the beginning. I mean, there's, you can't now say we've succeeded, we'll walk away. Um, but very significant uh, changes that's happened. Why is that? Because you have a lot of the states that are putting skin in the game, they're working together. Um, they're learning from each other, as, as Andy said. I mean, people are, um, you know, are stealing from each other and copying, which is exactly what you want. You want this sort of replication um, to occur. So what, what are a couple things to pay attention to, maybe going forward, that could be done better? Um, it's been mentioned already, you know, federal support, ITC and PTC, great. Um, but what, where, how do you, where does it go from there? Um, I mean, clearly you're going to have to have a glide path from those. They're not going to last forever. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a real opportunity for much more creative thinking about where that can go, but it's sort of stuck, unfortunately, now. Um, there are a series of partnerships that have started and, and they're in place that have been effective over time. They need to be expanded and funded better. There are energy storage partnerships between the DOE and the states. Um, there are significant partnerships between states um, and the federal government on offshore wind. Um, they probably could be expanded more and strengthened more. Um, I mean, the federal government tends to do a good job at, at, at technology development. Um, could do a better job at market development, support, acceleration of deployment by working more directly with the states. Um, ARPA is a good example, great program, needs to connect more with the market. Um, innovative financing. Um, the states really have been the leaders in figuring out um, how to move from a pure grant game and a rebate game to um, much more intelligent financing. Um, and whether that's uh, revolving loan funds, bond finance, uh, a lot of kind of the green bank ideas that you're seeing coming out of Connecticut. Um, this is a, 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 tr a dramatic change in the way states are beginning to figure out how to leverage their money um, because it's a dollar for dollar or a dollar for five. Um, that's critically important. Federal government's kind of catching up and that's okay. I mean, I think the states are the leaders in this. They're closer to the ground. They see what has to happen. They can move much more quickly. Um, but states, but the feds, again, have to be in a, a much more strongly uh, supportive role. One of the ideas we've had, and I don't know what we've handed out here today, and I know no one, there's never any money here for anything significant, it seems, anymore in Washington, but a, a program that actually could um, help states uh, provide better credit enhancement for projects and companies, something we're called the uh, State Clean Energy Finance Initiative, that's based on an existing federal program. It's a state small business credit initiative, sort of a one to ten match. You put a billion in, states are going to are, will be able to leverage that for 10, and you're going to have a, a dramatically expanded um, investment in projects and companies going forward. Not sure where that's going to go anywhere, but I think it's a, it's a very good idea. Um, one other point is, is power resiliency. Um, and what this means is that, you know, after uh, events like Sandy, I can tell you in the Northeast um, that things have changed, um, that the of dramatic effects of that storm in the Northeast in, the, in those states have changed the political dynamic uh, about doing something going forward. And it doesn't matter if you believe in climate change or you don't. It, you look across the board, and from some governors who are skeptical to others who, who are strong believers, they are all doing something. And they're beginning to put serious money into revolving loan funds for critical public infrastructure. Um, they are mandating, proposing to mandate in renewable portfolio standards that there be required investment, utility investments in storm response facilities, whether it's hospitals or the rest. They're financing more combined heat and power systems so power doesn't go out. This is a power outage problem. You know, the significant effect that you had from Sandy is that 8 million people lost power, in many cases for weeks at a time. Um, and significant health effects, um, significant, obviously, economic damage. You had um, places like uh, NYU Medical School that lost power for a significant period of time. Um, and that raises some questions about what the federal government maybe could be doing better. Um, more uh, de uh, dedication of FEMA money to actual investments in, in resilient distributed generation. Uh, also questions about why NIH that funds um, all the medical research facilities in the country 
has not done more to make sure that um, entities like NYU Medical School went black. Because 10 years prior to that, uh, when New York City had a blackout, the same thing happened to Columbia Medical School. And in both cases, millions of dollars of medical research were lost. Your public money were lost. And so it's a question of whether for failure to have a smarter power system at those places, maybe you all lost the cure for cancer. Because in the basement of NYU Medical School, there were millions of genetically engineered mice that were designed for specific cancer tests, and they were all destroyed. Is that worth a little money? Maybe so. So in the end, I think it, it's helpful to have better, as Carol said, stories told in D.C. about what's happening in the States. Um, if you don't get out of D.C., please do. Um, uh, it's really a good thing. Uh, and I think, you know, the states are, they're not stopping. <laughs> That's the other thing about this. You know, it's not like a movement, you know, it's not like a political movement, and boy, there's all and there's backtracking. It's established. And so I think it's a question of, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slide off the tracks occasionally, but it seems like everybody's trying to move pretty full steam ahead. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Lou. I think it's, once again, it's really um, uh, exciting to kind of see the things that are going on, both in terms of what's happening at the state level, what that means in terms of thinking about replication, but also in terms of where there are needs and whereby working together and, and uh, you know, sort of putting um, the feds, states, localities together, it can really make a huge difference. And, and uh, as Lou mentioned, um, the need for greater resilience after looking at things like the um, Hurricane Sandy, et cetera. Just want to mention that I would call your attention back to two briefings that we did uh, in May that really were looking at this issue. One briefing was on combined heat and power on CHP. The other one was on district energy, CHP, and microgrids. And on this very, really framed around this whole point of, of resilience, and, and in terms of talking about medical institutions, um, on one panel, we had the, the, the um, manager of Princeton's energy facility, Princeton University, and one of the things that he talked about was that because they were able to stay up because of their CHP district energy facility at Princeton University, they saved more than $200 million worth of research, right to your point. That a lot of times there are these things that we just don't think about, and we really need to help each other think of these things and really be about problem solving. So let's open it up for your questions and comments, and if you could just identify yourself, please. And I will also look back here, see whether there are any questions. Any hands up? Okay, here first. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, I'm Ethan Goffman from, oh, I'm Ethan, Ethan Goffman from Sustainability Science Practice and Policy, and these all seem to be great innovations, but is it fair to say this is pretty much just the beginning, and it's still only a few percent, like two or three percent of energy is solar and wind. So this is really just the uh, laboratory, but you, you, you still need exponential growth, right? So maybe any comments about how quickly you can scale it up? And also, my impression is that you, you, you also need great advances in energy efficiency and a lot less overall use of energy, which is happening, but maybe more the big picture, how those two can work together. Okay, I think just about anybody, and, go ahead, yeah. Andrew, because stuff is happening really fast in terms of scale. Yeah, there's, there's a, I mean, I think um, all of us in, in the California policy community are painfully aware of both of the things, you know, that, that you just pointed out. Um, but you've got to start somewhere, and we're making incredible gains, um, and the economics are there, uh, no question about it, for, for solar moving forward. There are lots of issues, you know, don't get me wrong, there's, there's definitely some barriers out there. Rate design is coming up. We have, uh, you know, natural gas prices are relatively low, so there's, there's sort of a, that's changing the dynamic of the discussion a little bit. But fundamentally, in California, we have uh, very heavy-duty carbon reduction goals. Um, 
uh, we, we've taken coal off the table. We, we, we also have an innovation economy where there's lots of great technology that can help us solve these problems. This is all contained within the sort of broader issue of the need for grid flexibility and sort of the distributed energy future that we're headed down that we're headed down the tracks towards. I mean, this is just a fact of, that, that we have to that we're we're promoting and trying to adapt uh, to at the same time. So it's uh, got a lot of upside potential, and we want to do it right as regulators. I, you know, speak for my agency and for the PUC on that. Energy efficiency. We actually have a law in California. It's called Assembly Bill 758. Uh, and it was passed a few years ago, and we're just now implementing it. And it uh, has the commission tasks the Energy Commission with developing a plan to radically reduce, uh, or really to radically scale up the um, upgrades of existing buildings. Most of the buildings that are going to be with us in 50 years are already with us. And so, or in 2050, rather, are already with us. So we need to find out, we need to figure out ways that, to, to get in those buildings and, and generate demand for the services that we know the technologies and services actually are there to provide. So it's really about providing, it's about figuring out what works with customers, consumers, uh, what business models. And so I agree there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't really at this point call it experimentation, but I would say there's a lot of uh, hard work out there in the marketplace to figure this out. Um, it sounds like you're involved in that, and I, I think that's terrific. Um, we at the Energy Commission and certainly at the PUC and all of our stakeholders across the state, and, and from what I'm gathering, uh, interacting a lot with the other states, similar there, really, I think, appreciate that this is a, um, a team effort and that you can't do it from above. You really have to grow things from the, um, in, in collaboration with the marketplace. So I think that's a, that in and of itself is a really, uh, I think, a sea change from where we were uh, ten years ago, so i 'm extremely hopeful actually uh, the the lift is definitely large, but I think uh, the solutions are becoming much clearer by the day and i 'm very encouraged by that um, Anybody else want to go ahead Amy. sure hi um, yeah I, I would just uh, confirm everything that uh, he just said, but it, it truly is a multi prong approach. Um, you do look at energy efficiency. I mean, that's why in, in Maryland, you know, th three of the 15 strategic goals get into the energy efficiency, the greenhouse gas, and then really looking at renewables because they do intertwine and they do play important roles. Um, the other big thing is, you know, technology is really moving this very quickly, um, the advancement. So you, you'll see, I think, exponentially the increase in renewables. And also the confidence and consumers are, you know, the demand is getting there. So it's, it's, it's all forming. It's all coming together at once. It's, you know, it's been, it, it looks like maybe it's a slow climb, and yes, it's a few percentages, but I think exponentially you'll see in all the states, it's just going to, it's rapidly taking off and is taking off. Great. Okay. Anybody? Else? Okay. Sorry. Hi, I'm Pondy, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, with the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and, um, I, I live in Vermont, and there is a, um, a minority, but a vocal minority, that are really pushing back hard against wind, um, you know, saying that there hasn't been um, enough research about um, environmental impacts and all that sort of stuff. So I was just wondering um, what, if anything, has been done to help address this, to do education or outreach to try to rectify some of these misconceptions about, um, about wind power. Okay, there's been a lot done. Go ahead. Uh, we're having those same issues in Massachusetts. In fact, Fatema Falmouth put to a town referendum just a couple weeks ago a vote to take down two wind turbines, um, which have been the subject of complaints for the last few years. Uh, when people voted anonymously, uh, uh, it was shot down two to one, the option to pay for taking them down, although it's not going to stifle the effort to remove them. And I think um, the, 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 what we've done in Massachusetts is we have significantly ramped up the upfront stakeholder outreach so that more parties are at the table when the decisions about siting are being made. We are actually using our money to pay for facilitated stakeholder processes for new turbine uh, developments to bring not only abutters but other, you know, entities in town to talk through the issues. Massachusetts as, as well as Oregon have been leaders in providing funding for feasibility studies to make sure the right technical studies are done. But if the right people aren't at the table uh, to listen to 
those technical studies and provide their input and make sure their question's being answered, at the end of the day, they reject that technical study and don't listen to it and shout down the project at a public meeting, which isn't a good, good use of time or, or our money. So we're very focused on, um, on more upfront uh, stakeholder outreach. And we think it's not only relevant to wind, but it'll be relevant to anaerobic digestion, large-scale solar, uh, you know, all sorts of things that uh, are increasingly visible to people's lives and raise concerns about changing community character and, and all those things, as well as, uh, you know, concerns about uh, impacts on the environment and, and health. I also live in Vermont, so uh, I've seen this uh, up front. Um, I think there are a couple of things going on. I mean, I think there's always been within the environmental community a, you know, a conflict in many cases between sort of the, a preservation or conservation ethic and a technology solution, and that's part of it. Um, you know, Vermont also has, uh, in some cases, can be a bit overly precious um, a bit about, uh, but it's a very unique place. So there's a sense in which once you've, you know, lost the landscape or lost a part of that ridge line, it's gone forever. Um, the difficulty with sort of accepting that in Vermont is that it was fine for 50 years to build ski areas that do the same, um, but if you put up a couple uh, turbines, then it's the end of the world. Uh, but I think, that, I think the larger problem is that it's sort of a short-term versus a long-term thing. Um, you know, the, the sort of the fight in Vermont is, you know, this, if you put up five or six turbines, doesn't, mat, doesn't mount to much, and, you know, you balance it off against something else. And, um, and, and sort of getting the, the larger uh, debate as part of that is, is difficult. And it's also a uniquely Vermont problem on energy because Vermont tends to um, make sure that all of its power is made somewhere else. Um, so uh, apart from the nuclear plant that we have, which the state has been trying to close down for 10 years, um, it buys the bulk of its power from Canada. So it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind problem as well, <clears throat> which if you're at all concerned about individual responsibility may not be the may not be a path you want to take. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments? Did you want to say? Yeah, I was just to say um, that's a big part of what we're doing for offshore wind with the Exelon funds is really doing the surveys. Um, you know, we have a, a list like of the geophysical uh, surveys. Uh, the big thing we've done is partner with other agencies, our Department of Natural Resources, that really looks at this and protects the wildlife um, and the habitat along the coast and in the state of Maryland. So we've partnered with them and the universities and then have hired um, different uh, firms to actually go out, start mapping, surveying, to make sure that, you know, we aren't upsetting um, the environmental issues that are going on with some of these projects. So very much so. Um, yeah, I just want uh, so, to, th this question rings very true to me, even though I'm not, you know, I, I actually did live in Vermont long ago, but uh, San Diego is not that similar, I have to say. But um, um, I, the Energy Commission um, is also, the, it's the state's policy, it's the state's planning, um, energy planning agency in California, and we actually, um, part of the reason we were created back in 1974 was to site power plants and, and permit power plants. So we have a process where you, if you apply for a power plant and anybody can do it, uh, it will come out the back end um, fully mitigated and compliant with state law. Um, so that is true for renewables plants and it's true for, for traditional plants and thermal power plants. Um, and, but, but what it does is bring one agency kind of into one agency that the trade-offs very explicitly where uh, energy efficiency becomes uh, in demand response and some of these demand side resources and a supply side actually are uh, dealt with in the same agency. And so uh, California has had per capita electricity consumption uh, be flat for the last 35 years because of our building standards and our appliance standards work and uh, all the different energy efficiency programs that we have. And that is uh, uh, very conscious because the more energy efficiency we get, the fewer power plants we have to site. And so uh, the better our appliances perform, the better our buildings perform, the fewer power plants we have to site. And that applies for any, any of the power plants because they're all hard to site, even if they're renewable. So we have very aggressive renewables goals, but um, it, it, you know, it's never easy to site anything. Transmission, um, you know, the, the electric system is a big, complex, capital-intensive thing. Uh, so what we're trying to do is figure out ways to optimize what we've got do incremental investments, work with the utilities to help them, you know, figure out that the sky isn't actually falling, um, and uh, do 
have as robust and diverse a mix of supply as we can. So I think all of these things are related. We were talking about this before. They're all related. So you've seen a little cross-section of individual projects here, but they all you know, feed into the same larger questions. Uh, so I just I thought I'd put a little context there. Thank you. I happen to be the Vermont State Rep to the National Association of Home Builders and skipped my executive board to come here because <laughs> I think okay. it's more important. Um, I want to really emphasize a point that you made. Energy efficiency has to go hand in hand because if we don't have it, we have to build larger wind farms and larger solar fields and have more fights. So um, I'm going to be meeting with our congressman tomorrow I'm going to bring all this up, and it was going to be about energy efficiency, but I'm kind of really disappointed that Vermont's not farther along joining your group. So I'm going to talk about that and see what we can do to move that along. So. Over here. Uh huh. Um, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason Berwin from the American Energy Innovation Council. I want to ask, maybe this is for Andrew and for Andy, specifically, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about if we're going to try to get more private financing into renewable energy, clean energy, uh, how to do that, for example, making access to public capital markets as a backed type of, uh, of securities, and that renewable energy and energy efficiency assets could conceivably pose as that. You, you both work for organizations that have in some way uh, been aggregating or working on uh, creating a large number of projects. And I'm wondering, are you in some way aggregating that information, intentionally trying to work into uh, those policy efforts to increase the ability for private finance to get into these types of projects? I'm happy to go first. Thanks for the question. <laughs> um, I'll speak to my Massachusetts experience, uh, which uh, through the Sunshot Initiative partnered with DOE, one of the things we did was meet with local regional scale banks to educate them about the process. And one very interesting workshop we had with that, uh, which I think gets to a lot of the themes I was talking about with Solarize, is that we, we have an aware, awareness problem. We met in a room full of bankers and lawyers in downtown Boston, very well dressed, very sharp, some of whom had led significant money to uh, projects. And I kicked it off with a discussion just of the basic technologies, what they looked like, how they basically worked, and, and then other people got into the minutia of financing and so forth. And on the assessment forms, it turned out that what they needed was the 101 presentation that, you know, people aren't comfortable seeing and touching and feeling and, and having confidence in, in these things. And there's a very limited understanding. We know there's a limited understanding at the residential scale, and that's why we're doing projects like Solarize. But we need to do the same awareness building for the banks, uh, for, you know, other, uh, uh, the, the private capital markets. And when you do it uh, and show them the data on project performance and, and so forth, I think you can build, build that confidence. So there's a role for currently for the states to be backstopping uh, the financing and encouraging their participation. But I think very rapidly they'll show that the results are there. The default rates you know, on these loans and all that they'd be making will be very low. The very limited amount of data that's currently available um, certainly supports that. And I think we'll very quickly provide you know, confidence to those markets. So that's, that's where we're headed. Let me just mention one thing and hand it over to Andrew. If we have a project, just as a quick one, as an answer to your question, um, with the um, it's a group called the Council of Development Finance Agencies, which is the essentially membership organization of all of the municipal bond authorities in the country. Uh, and it's, it's called uh, it's CE, Clean Energy Bond Finance Initiative, CEBFI.org, the website, the whole bit. Uh, the whole idea behind this is to um, you know, essentially convert clean energy investment into a new asset class um, so that um, you can access capital markets just like you access capital markets now for roads, bridges, hospitals, and all kinds of other things that um, uh, public finance does. Um, and getting from here to there is not easy, but there's a lot of interest in making it happen. Uh, it's not insurmountable, uh, but it, and it can be done. So take a look at the website, and I'll give you a little bit there. 
So yeah, I'll, I'll agree with what's been said here. The, really, the key thing is to build investor confidence, um, and I think that's I think that's critical. Um, you know, I was in, sort of in the ground floor in California, at least on the pay, the pace property assessed finance um, issues. You know, very big bucket of cold water from Fannie and Freddie on that, and it hasn't been resolved. Uh, so that's one sector. I think that was never going to be the golden carrot, you know, the, the sort of the the, the uh, one size fits all approach. Um, I think really sectors are different. They need different kinds of products, and financiers have to, you know, the capital markets have to figure that out. So experience, really, no no substitute for experience. Uh, I would caution though that I think a lot of a lot of um, I think financing is wonderful. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm into it. Um, uh, but it's sort of like the in the old days uh, of uh, you know rural electrification. I worked for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association for ten years, um, and uh, the lore you know generations ago was you build a you build a line, you build a, a power line out into some rural area, and they get development, right? It, they they just magically become developed, and that is not true. It's a necessary condition, you could argue, but it's not a sufficient condition. And I think financing sort of falls in that category for clean energy, where if we had demand. And if people were demanding these products and they were making deals with contractors, there's enough private capital on the sidelines where it would beat the path to those projects. And so they need the mechanisms and the pathways to get to those projects. But I think uh, where we really need, um, particularly in the energy efficiency realm, you know, with solar, there's an asset there that's tangible. It's much easier to have that conversation with, a, with, a, with the, uh, somebody representing the capital markets with a bank. Uh, energy efficiency is a little more diverse, hard to get your head around. Um, and I think uh, bundling up a bunch of home energy upgrades or business energy upgrade projects is a little more complicated. It can be done. It's absolutely cost effective. And I think you'll find if you look at the projects across the country that default rates are incredibly low. Um, Sonoma County has a has a, a large portfolio relative you know relative to their county size and population. They have a large portfolio of great projects and a super low default rate. Um, and and they're, they continue to do property assessed financing, even though um, you know, they're the restrictions around Fannie and Freddie. So um, uh, I, think, I think experience is really important here. It seems to be happening really at the local level, and at some point that will become relevant uh, to the capital markets in, in ways that, are, that, that really matter. And you know, going back to the other theme, yes, the, the, the advances are incremental, but at some point the dam breaks and things really change, and I think we're getting pretty close to that. Um, what, what we found in the state of Maryland is that each sector is quite different. Uh, for the residential sector, we were successful in doing a loan loss reserve and doing a buy down. Um, and we do that through the Maryland Clean Energy Center. It's kind of a quasi state, um, state agency. Um, so they offer loans for energy efficiency, working very closely with the HVAC installers. Uh, for businesses, especially small businesses, uh, through the utility, um, the PSC, the state program of doing rebates and grants, it's getting that extra money. I mean, once you have the rebates, it's the rest of, like, for a lighting job, the rest of the cost. Um, so we're going to be starting, um, we have funding from the Exelon we put into what we call an advanced, and it's working with Baltimore Gas and Electric where they would pay for the small ones that, uh, that money and then just bill them on their bill. So it's not the loan set up, but an advanced set up, it's just a, a different way of doing it to target that. So there's different mechanisms that we kind of to get around the pace problem with Fannie and Freddie Mac that, you know, we've looked at from a state agency. but. It is. And then, as was said, you know, with the tangible solar, leasing has just exploded. So it's, you know, a self, you know, funding type of thing. I think that is part of the interesting thing is that, that there are a variety of mechanisms that are being tried and it's been incredible looking at the numbers with regard to the leasing in various cities across the country with regard to solar projects with some companies where it has become an unbelievably successful business model. And so I think we're going to be seeing more and more different approaches uh, depending upon what makes sense for what sector of the market. And again, it's kind of up to everybody, to all of us, working together to figure out what does make sense and what are the different models. And, and we are now out of time, but um, I want you to join with me in thanking this wonderful panel.